Okay, well, uh, welcome everybody for another uh, conversation on the future of work. Uh, as we're getting started, let me quickly acknowledge the National Science Foundation for partially funding this effort and also the um, organizers and, and uh, or share and myself are gonna be uh, running this conversation today. Uh, this is a recorded conversation and please put your questions in the chat and then or it will be monitoring that and, and uh, we'll be calling on you. So it's uh, a real pleasure to welcome Cliff Lampy. Cliff is a professor in the School of Information at the University of Michigan. He previously was at uh, Michigan State University. He researches the social and technical structures of large scale technology mediated communication and he works with websites like uh, websites like Facebook, Wikipedia, Slashdot, everything too. And I think it's it's important to say that one of Cliff's core values is combining uh, top culture research and community engagement. And uh, we were just talking about Kai 2022, and Cliff is actually a uh, co-general chair of Kai 2022. So Cliff. Um, Today, we're gonna to be talking about social capital. So you've explored this topic for a number of, of years. And I wanted to start by asking you about what social capital is, and perhaps let's, let's start with the real world, not necessarily online. So what is social capital? Yeah, that's a great question. So social capital fundamentally is capital, right? And the important thing about capital is that it's fungible to other types of capital. So it's, it's a resource. Social capital is basically the resource that exists from the maintenance and establishment of durable social networks or social relationships, All right? So every time you build a network, you build a relationship with somebody, um, basically you can tap into that relationship and convert it into another form of capital, right? It could be physical capital in terms of borrowing money. So like, you know, if you needed to borrow $500, who would you go to, right? A stranger? Uh, no, probably most people would start with like somebody who in a close relationship with them. Um, the capital could be human capital in terms of reviewing time. If I need an emergency review for my conference paper, I'm going to tap into somebody with whom I've had an established relationship and, and, and try to do that. If I'm going to trick somebody into being the, the chair of the CHI steering committee, right? Like you're going to go to somebody who's done that for a long time. So it's, it's an important resource because it basically uh, facilitates all sorts of organizational processes, right? Social capital as a resource exists in potential in all of these social networks and it kind of sits there ready to be tapped into and provides trust that allows us to you know um you know uh, do work like reviewing do all kinds of important organizational work that depends on both the human capital of actually getting the work done but as well as the trust that the work's going to be done for us um other people have talked about social capital in really interesting ways. So uh, Robert Putnam um, uh, divided it into two types of capital, bridging and bonding that are dependent roughly on strong and weak tie relationships. So bridging social capital is the kind of social cap is the, is the benefit you get from having weak tie resources that are um, you know, not strong relationships, but can provide you with things like diverse in inputs or um, information about things that you don't know a lot about. Right, um, Strength of Weak Ties is a classic article by Mark Granovetter in sociology that talks about the resources that you get from having a rich, diverse network of, you know, basically acquaintances and uh, not necessarily just strong friends. Um, so social capital has been uh, recognized since the 1960s uh, with some of the work that uh, took place in education research as being so important to human individual development, but as well as organizational practice. And um, I think it's core to so many of the processes that we just take for uh, granted every single day. Oh, when we move online, what does social capital look like? And also how do you build it? How do you maintain it? Yeah, I want to make a pitch uh, for an article written by my old thesis supervisor, Paul Resnick. He wrote a, a paper in like the year 2000 called Beyond Bowling Together, uh, Sociotechnical Capital. Um, his, his article is a reflection of something that Bob Putnam had been talking about. Bob 
Putnam wrote an article called Bowling Alone, which was a reflection on social capital in the United States and how it was decreasing over time because we weren't participating in volunteer organizations in the United States as much anymore, right? So fewer people were doing um, things like the Elks Club or the Moose Lodge or any of the animal-based clubs that you hear about. And so his worry was that social capital was declining. And when social capital declines, you get, you get bad outcomes, right? You get more distrust, you get worse health outcomes even. Um, Resnick's reflection was the fact that are there new forms of social capital that are forming because of the affordances of these technical systems that we're now interacting in. Um, one of his affordances, for instance, that he talked about was large fan out, which is basically the ability to broadcast in a lot of these online platforms. Um, so can you, for instance, gain more types of social capital by having an audience, right? Um, one of the things that Dr. Nicole Ellison and I worked on early in our careers was like, what are the effects of social network sites and how they can change the social capital work? One of the things we saw, for instance, is that like sites like Facebook and Friendster back in the day made it much easier to maintain and nurture a broad set of uh, relationships. So, you know, how do you form a relationship? Really, it's about attention, right? Like when you have a relationship, the, the thing that builds a friendship, builds an acquaintance ship even, is the fact that I have spent some of my precious attention that's very limited on you. Right. And that kind of gift of my attention converts to social capital. Right? My human capital of attention converts to the social capital. Uh, then I can tap back into that later and it kind of keeps growing. It's an investment. Uh, with online spaces, what can happen is I can basically spread out my attention in different ways and with some support of tools. One of the most unambiguously popular and still probably only unambiguously popular aspects of Facebook is the birthday messaging system, right? Like the fact that I remind you of people's birthdays and you can wish them happy birthday. That is a great example of how we do that social grooming, how you spend that just little bit of your attention and it just reminds people, hey, I have a relationship with you. I've invested my effort in that relationship. Um, someday I'm going to call on you for a favor, right? Like, you know, it's just, it's that kind of thing. It's, it just keeps building uh, those relationships. And that's, that's what technology does. It both hurts and helps kind of our traditional generation of social capital. So I'm glad you mentioned uh, Facebook because your, your uh, most cited paper is about Facebook. And it starts out by saying, well, Facebook is a, a very popular website. And so many things have changed. So what do you think has changed in the last decade or so since that paper came out? Over a decade, I think, right? Oh my God, I am so old. Yeah, it's been a while. <laughs> I mean, there's a few things like, you, you know, uh, remember this, right? Picture it, right? 2007, uh, the, social like the social network sites were still in kind of the wild west in 2007, right? Like I remember people asking me when, when was MySpace going to finally crush Facebook and, you know, and, and take over? Uh, we still had like a, a rich ecology of, I think, very special interest um, social network sites like, um, you know, we had Mi Gente and Asian Avenue and J-Day and a whole bunch, like this rich panoply um, of of kind of um, uh, identity-based sites. Internationally, sites were very diverse, right? Like if you looked at Skyrock in France or uh, what was going on with High Five or Orkut, like it was just, it was, um, what always happens when you have a new media come along, right? Which is in, there's a great book called The Master Switch by Tim Wu, where he talks about how every kind of media enterprise has a period in which there's this wild proliferation of alternatives. And then what you get is market consolidation. Right. So when radio comes out, you have everybody running a small radio station and then ABC, NBC and CBS buy up everything and consolidate the market. It was the same thing with social network sites. You had this rich panoply of social network sites in 2007. And so there's just so many different alternatives and different ways to think about social networks at the time. Um, and so that's one of the things that's changed is the market's truly consolidated. Sure, you still get new social media like TikTok comes along or uh, Parler or things like that. But I think kind of that um, 
time of intense investment and intense kind of experimentation has mostly subsided at this point. Uh, the other really big change that's happened since then is the number of people that came on. Um, my advisor thought I was foolish to study social network sites uh, when I was getting my PhD because something like 6% of the US internet using population was on online communities and social media at that time, right? It seemed like a real fool's errand of <laughs> like, you know, in terms of HCI topics. Um, but then uh, proving that it's better to be lucky than to be smart, like the rest <laughs> of the world moved into kind of these online uh, community spaces, into social media, basically, right? So like from 2007 to 2010, basically, you kind of saw the mass population of social network sites and social media. And that really also changed the nature of those platforms, both in terms of like suddenly the money that was flowing in um, as well. And uh, related to that was the type of advertising that you can do. For those of us old enough to remember, advertising on uh, internet in 2007 was still stuff like server farm advertising. It was all like basically the only thing you could advertise on the internet was other internet stuff. And now, of course, like I knew that the day I would see a Tide ad on the internet, that the internet had truly arrived at the platform. And now you see them all the time, right? So like that's the other thing that changed with the mass population of the sites. Got it. Um, Cliff, you've also looked a great deal at uh, harassment online, and part of this is your your uh, work with uh, HeartMob, which is a website dedicated to helping those who experience online harassment and ultimately ending online harassment as a goal. So, can you tell us more about HeartMob, or more generally about online harassment and your work in it? Yeah, and I would say, I mean, I was really happy to work with HeartMob. It was a great platform uh, that was run through the Sassafras Collective and, and some others. I, I mostly just did research with them. I, uh, the credit for that site goes to a whole bunch of other people. Um, and they have a lovely idea, which is that, you know, when you look at harassment offline and when you look at intervention strategies offline, they, the idea there is never to confront the harasser. Right, like that, that that's always the worst thing to do and it escalates situations. That what you should do is you should provide support to the person being harassed. But when we look at harassment in, off, in online spaces, that's almost never done. Right, like that, that there's no systematic way to support the harassed person. Um, and because so many of like the content moderation schemes that exist in our social media platforms are based in a criminal justice model, like they focus on punishment of the perpetrator instead of support of the target of harassment. And so HeartMob was really focusing, and, and there've been some efforts since then, Amy Zhang's been working on some stuff related to that. Um, I know Nilafar has been working on some stuff like that. So it's like, you know, I think that idea of supporting the target of harassment has, uh, has taken off a little bit more, but HeartMob was definitely there first in terms of like, how do we actually get somebody to, um, you know, really uh, spend that time and uh, support the person who's been harassed. And Jill Diamond is one of the researchers associated with that who worked with us on the paper. And I'd like, just like to call out her work as being truly exceptional. Thank you. So um, since we're talking about the future of work, um, what are your thoughts kind of combining these ideas that we've discussed so far, where do you, you know, we're all working from home now. Well, most of us, right? And what, how do you see your work, and how do you see the future, the future of work? What, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, it's tough. So, and it's it's a good question. We were talking a little bit as we started this call too about what's the impact on social capital of all of this kind of technological mediation. Um, and so far, it's been not great for a variety of reasons, right? Like, we have always participated in virtual organizations, right? Like, SIGCHI and our academic conferences are, in effect, virtual organizations. Uh, it's just they have different affordances. And one of the things we have found with them is that it is occasionally a good idea to kind of juice up that social capital connection by having occasional awesome conferences in New Orleans, Louisiana, where we binge on beignets and gumbo and, you know, have a great time, right? And 
and the, the the true secret of social capital is that it's about disclosure, right? It's about, you know, making yourself a little bit vulnerable and disclosing a little bit about yourself to be able to bore to, to create affective bonds with people that then allow for the work to happen in a lot of different ways, right? So, you know, Andrew, you and I, Regan, we've been through some tough meetings together, right? Where there've been like tears and fights and the whole nine yards. Um, but that would have been much harder to do if we didn't have the social capital built up to be able to kind of get through a meeting like that. So, you know, um, one of the consequences of having mostly these virtualized um, meetings is that we cut off before and after time, right? We cut off break time. Um, we don't have these opportunities to just kind of talk and shoot the breeze and say, hey, how are the kids doing, right? Like, what are you guys doing around your school plan? Like stuff that's totally orthogonal to the work being done, but is essential to building opportunities for future work to be done, right? That's the true value of social capital in these cases is that, you know, it seems often like if you were to look at it from like a, you know, Gilbreth uh, efficiency expert, like, you know, perspective, it would look like it's wasting time. It's about being off topic but it's so much not, right? We've seen this with online communities for years, right? Online communities that are resilient are able to go off topic and talk about personal matters and then shift back to the collaborative work that they're doing, right? Like it's just, it's an important aspect of how we get things done. And so when I look at uh, what's happening to work in a heavily mediated environment, it's uh, cutting off our acquaintance ties, right? It's been brutal to weak ties because it's just too expensive to maintain them now, right? Like it's hard enough to maintain our strong ties in this mediated environment. So we're sacrificing kind of that loose tie network in favor of that. It also means that um, people are, I think, missing out on social capital and that disproportionately affects people who have been always particularly vulnerable with organizations, which includes women and people of color disproportionately to white males, right? So, you know, that's something we have to acknowledge is that I think the pandemic has had disproportionate effects on women more broadly, obviously, from all the research that we've seen in the past six months. And I think as part of that, that's been undiscussed so far is uh, social capital consequences, right? Um, and what that means. So I think, uh, I wish that we did more, even at an organizational level, both within our units, within businesses that I've seen, to do more of that kind of building trust type of uh, work. Um, we've been thinking about this a lot for CHI 2022, right? And how do we do this with that virtual organization? And uh, one of the things I am going to try to do to, to help with that is revive CHI Place. Uh, a few of you might be old enough to remember Kai Place, but it was an online community for the Kai community, right? The idea here is that uh, we should be building asynchronous interactions that allow for us to have opportunities to share and to disclose up to the point when we have this intense synchronous interaction, right? So the asynchronous interactions can help build social capital and they, they can be totally off topic. And then we can use the synchronous interactions and get the work done at that point. Um, so what does that look like? You know, when I've been working on this with different organizations and with classes and everything, like it doesn't have to be super heavy stuff, right? Like one of the most popular and the, one of the things that works most often is share pictures of your pets. Talk about your pets, right? Like, what do you love about your cat? Like, well, what, what, what crazy things your dog do today? I, I don't get it, but people love their animals, right? Like um, it could be about vacation pics. It could be about your kids. Like, you know, if you're willing to share that stuff, and we can find stuff to talk about. And that can rebuild those social capital connections. The trouble is we have to be purposive about it. And I haven't seen anybody be that purposive about making the opportunity, partially because I, I don't know, it feels exhausting, right? We talk about Zoom fatigue and how hard it is to be on Zoom. And I get that. And I don't think the solution is to have like more Zoom cocktail hours or anything like that. I, I think mostly we want to push this into asynchronous interaction, other types of interactions that we can use to build trust. So I see that there are plenty of questions. So maybe I'll hand over to yes. Orit and. Uh... Great, so there, there are plenty of questions, but I really want to start with a question and then connect it to Rima. Um, how do you quantify or evaluate social capital? So how kind of, how can I know how much do I have? How much does another person have? And can it translate to organization as well? Can, can SIGCHI have social capital? 
Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, in my old lab, we used to uh, joke around about lampy bucks, right? That we were gonna we we're gonna try to tokenize social capital and call them lampy bucks for my claim to fame. That's how I was gonna get famous. Um, you know, it's interesting. There's a big debate in the literature about how you quantify social capital, and the debate tends to be between sociologists and economists. Sociologists. Um, quantify social capital by the nature of the social network, right? So for them, it's anathema to talk about social capital as a resource. They hate it when I do that. Uh, so we're talking about like people like Ron Burt and Wayne Baker and, and some of the classic sociologists there. The way they would quantify so, uh, social capital is through your network of relationships. There's a few different ways of doing that, right? One would be a straight up kind of name generator. Where are you in the social network and how are you connected? What's your betweenness centrality? What's your eigenvector centrality? things like that. Another one is through um, a resource locator, right? Who in the network do you have access to? So they do quantify social capital pretty um, explicitly, but it's through basically network structure that they quantify it. Um, in terms of the, the economists, I would say that um, like the, they've been a little bit more loosey-goosey about it, unlike most economists. And that's partially because I have found that it's really ephemeral, right? Once you start trying to quantify social capital, it immediately starts going down in value, right? Like one of my favorite uh, social capital theorists is Dale Carnegie in his book, How to Win Friends and Influence People, right? He talks about that kind of explicitly, right? He says like, look, you know, you can build these bonds, but the minute you try to say like, hey, I helped you move, now you owe me X hours worth of looking at my family vacation photos, then it becomes a physical, like a human capital, basically, exercise where you're then uh, measuring different things. Social capital is probably best when it's treated as a vague resource. So, so that kind of um, leads us to Re Rema. I hope I pronounced your name correctly, sorry. Uh, yeah, so I think you touched on some of the, <clears throat> some of the thrust of the questions that I have um, in terms of that. Uh, explicit versus implicit measure of social capital. Um, but I'm really fascinated by this, uh, this old practice in uh, David Graeber's book, uh, Debt the First 5,000 Years. Um, and in that um, people in like the 1700s in, uh, in England used to mint uh, debt tokens, like I'll give you 20 coins, each worth a loaf of bread and you can either give them to somebody else or whatever. So I'm just wondering if you're aware of any anybody who's done something close to that, like uh, a more modern example I can think of is, you know, somebody on GitHub, um, you know, fixes a bunch of bugs and then it's worth some pool somewhere. So I'm, I'm just curious about whether you think there are practices like that or if it just is gonna stay implicit. I mean, it's interesting, right? Like, uh, there's got to be some opportunities here, right? I, I, I'm totally ignorant in this space, but somehow the word blockchain keeps falling back to me, right? Or is there, is there an NFT for social capital? I love kind of thinking about that too. I, I think there is opportunity here, right? I don't think we've thought it through well enough. And I think there is probably some space to think about this. And sometimes you do see this being mentioned very explicitly, not necessarily with tokens, but like Darren Gergo comes to me and says, hey, you owe me a review for Tokai because I did a review for you for HCI Journal, right? Like, you know, sometimes it gets very explicit like that. But like, you know, uh, often it's not. I, lo I love the tokenization system. I love that idea. And that gets into Austin's question a little bit too about being social capital being transferable, right? Like that, that's a really interesting question. I think it's always been roughly transferable, right? Like I can use my social capital. I, like in, when I'm at a, at a conference, I use my social capital to introduce my students to researchers they want to meet, right? Um, uh, and I often will do that through kind of my advising capabilities uh, in industry, like Ron Burt talks about this quite a bit when he talks about um, structural holes and people who are good at bridging structural holes, that those folks are good at transferring social capital between groups and that that's part of their skill set. So it's, I think it is transferable, um, but again, it's never been like kind of cleanly articulated, like what's the wattage, right, of social capital? What's the, like, what's the resistance? look like? How much do you lose when you transfer it? I think all of these are still super ephemeral questions. So, so, so yeah, so kind of then I had a question about transfer, transferable in slightly a different angle. Uh, mm -hmm. Diana? Uh, 
Yeah, I've been thinking about influencers in the space and like we talked to Jen Goldbeck a few weeks ago who is a kind of influencer. So I'm wondering uh, about how these influencers are created through an algorithm. We have content creators on YouTube, TikTok and Instagram who a lot of the times create content based on what an algorithm wants. And that algorithm sort of gives them power and social capital in a way that I think is kind of non-organic in a way. It's not social capital in the way we would have in the real world where I know someone, we all know them, they're cool, they're popular, but more of an algorithm-based thing. So I'm wondering what you think about the ramifications of that, uh, this sort of uh, unmitigated power that's bestowed upon someone, not through social means, but through an algorithm. Yeah, that's a great question. And uh, so there's a great old theory that comes out of communication studies. Um, uh, I mean, this is like 1950s type of stuff with Ella Hugh Katz, and it's called parasocial relationships, right? So Katz talks about parasocial relationships and how it's possible to actually have a relationship with somebody you don't know, which is the type of relationship that we often have with celebrity, right? And the interesting thing about that relationship is that it, is and always has been manufactured, right? So now it's the algorithm manufacturing that relationship, but it used to be a gatekeeper, right? It used to be the publisher or the director or the studio or whoever it was, right? So, which was a, just a different kind of algorithm really. Um, so like those parasocial relationships, you know, still generate capital, which is interesting. Like I have been wanting to write a paper for 10 years. I just never seem to find the time to write, which is on the power of parasocial capital right? Like how do, how do these basically parasocial relationships generate themselves into action? And a lot of collective action we see, I think, generate from parasocial capital, right? Like I follow Alyssa Milano on Twitter because like I always have like since 2006, right? And uh, she's a big animal activist and I have donated to causes because she has done calls to action, right? Um, like that's, a type of social capital in action that I don't, I, I don't think we're fully understanding and fully capturing. So I think there's a lot of work to be done about influencers, about those parasocial relationships and what they mean for capital expenditures. So, so thank you, Cliff. So we, we kind of keep getting questions about specific kinds of environments. So Hannah had a question that is also kind of expanding the kind of environments. Hannah? Yes, hello. Um, so I was just wondering if you had observed any differences in how social capital is generated or exchanged in communities where the participants are largely anonymous. Um, I'm thinking like Reddit, for example, um, versus communities where, you know, you're supposed to know each other's real names um, and your thoughts about that. Yeah, it's interesting. I think um... So one of the interesting things about social capital, this is kind of true for a lot of forms of capital, is that it's both an effect of the individual or a capacity of the individual, but it's also a group effect, right? So groups and organizations where individuals have a lot of social capital are better off than groups and organizations where people don't. So you can actually have social capital that exists and is owned by the group as opposed to by the individual. So even in a truly anonymous environment, you can have social capital generation. And in very anonymous spaces like 4chan, there's a lot of social capital. And the way that it's used and signaled is through you know, um, particular language that they use, a lot of uh, um, terms and types of practices that show that you're an in-group member and can tap into kind of the norms of that group. In a group like Reddit, where you're pseudonymous, uh, pseudonymity versus real name doesn't seem to have a strong effect on social capital generation, right? Like if you can have full-on social network and full-on social capital existence in an entirely pseudonymous group of people, right? Um, when I did early work on Slashdot and on everything too, those were very pseudonymous environments. Um, and that gets back to Andrew's question, what's different since 2007? Before 2007, almost everything was pseudonymous, right? And now almost everything's real name. Um, but back then, like, you know, it, those pseudonymous networks generated a ton of social capital. And for, for a lot of people, the pseudonym was as real or more real than kind of their offline identity. Thank you. So, so thinking about <clears throat> specific groups, uh, Peter had a question. Yeah, um, 
and apologies if this is like a half form question in some ways, but you talked about this idea of like diversity of viewpoints as being one of these soft forms of social capital, right? Um, and I was thinking that, that that makes it possible for there to be a sort of paradoxical situation where you might have immense social capital in terms of you're a you know, well-networked white man who knows all these other white male friends in positions of power, but you have very little access to diverse viewpoints, right? And like, from the perspective of say an organization that might result in negative consequences where you're not able to tap into the right person to review that article who has the right perspective to see the problems with it, right? Yep. Um, so you can be both simultaneously social capital rich and social capital poor in a different way, right? Um, and I guess I just wonder if, like, like, have you thought about that? Is there, is there, I mean, maybe the, the sociologists are more right than the economists in terms of you can't reduce this to a number because of that kind of thing? I mean, I think the sociologists are right in that the shape of the network has a real impact on the type of social capital you're generating. So when you say that you can be social capital rich and social capital poor, I think that's absolutely true, right? So if you have a network that's tightly clustered and homogenous, you might be rich in a type of social capital, which is that kind of like bonding social capital. It's, you know, I could call on all my golf buddies. If I needed to borrow a Bentley, I can go to my white man's golf club and, and get somebody's Bentley, right? Um, but if I don't have those weaker tie connections to other groups, I'm not going to know the information passing from those groups, right? And so I'm going to be poor in that type of social capital, which is the diverse viewpoints, the surprising information, you know, um, the diverse practices. So it's, um, yeah, you're absolutely right. Like the structure, the shape of your network and how you explicitly set that up is hugely important, which is why I think it's important for organizations, including organizations like academic groups, to think very explicitly about how they're shaping their social networks, right, and their social structures. And I haven't seen many who pay that much attention to it. So, so talking about organizations, let's talk about the organization like SIGCHI for a minute. Uh, thinking about, you know, this coming Kai, the last year of conferences, who knows, maybe kind of some aspect of next year. And I'm thinking that there is a generation of graduate students, possibly kind of master students that are in a two years program that really fall on these two years. Um, and how do they even start to build social capital in Sikai events? <clears throat> how do we help especially students? Uh, that don't have this previous kind of social capital that we have for meetings, from conferences, from committees, um, to build that in an online environment? That's a great question because there's a real gap there, right? Like we're, it, there's going to be kind of a generation of students who have fallen into that gap that we need to probably do some explicit activities to help remediate that gap, right? And I think what that's going to be is when we do get together face to face, um, I could see, for instance, uh, scholarship programs to make sure that they get into more early career meetings. Um, I could see specific activities um, like uh, panels and courses around that so they can build those social networks. Like how you build your social network in a group like SIGCHI is, you know, through activities, right? Like it's being an SV, it's serving on a panel, it's going to a SIG. It's especially the most meaningful social capital you can build is where you have to sit with somebody uh, and things are sometimes going to get boring. And like the only alternative you have is to turn and talk to each other about your lives, right? And so it, and that just takes time to develop. And so we need to find ways to build that time into people's opportunity. And that always feels a little tough, right? Because everybody's so overwhelmed right now. It feels so bad to say like, I need you to spend time to do this thing. But we, we just have to come up with the activities for that. So thank you. I think that's a challenge for all of us to, to think about how do we kind of reintroduce social capital, especially for the student that I think were most vulnerable kind of because they fell on this uh, two years or starting graduate schools um, during these two years. Uh, so, so talking about uh, taking the time, I think we'll go back to Andrew to um, wrap up so we can take the time for more informal part of conversation. Very good. Um... Thank you very much, Cliff. This was really, and no heckling. I thought I know that you called for some heckling, some slightly, but maybe in the not, maybe in the non-recorded part. Well, you should see the private messages I'm getting. Oh, wonderful. Okay. I mean, truly, like brutal. I'm glad that something is happening there. Like, I mean, I think we've all gained a couple pounds in the pandemic, but that kind of language is just not cool. Uh, 
Okay, well, let's uh, wrap up this part. So again, thank you very much, Cliff. This was wonderful. Uh, next week, we're uh, gonna be uh, hosting Marieke Van Voet. Actually, Chris Janssen will be hosting her. Hi, Chris. And she'll be talking about mind wandering. Is it bad? So looking forward to that.